Funding for this CyberWire podcast is made possible in part by Duo. While remote work has been on the rise for years now, the recent rapid expansion of work-from-home culture presents new security challenges. It's Duo's mission to make application access more secure for organizations of all sizes. Duo's modern access security is designed to safeguard all users, devices, and applications so you can stay focused on what you do best. Give your organization the peace of mind that only complete device visibility can bring. Visit duo.sc slash cyberwire to sign up for a free 30-day trial. And we thank Duo for sponsoring our show. Microsoft wraps up its internal investigation of Solaragate, which the U.S. government continues to grapple with and which has had some effect on Norway. An apparent Iranian APT has been hosting its command and control in two Netherlands data centers. Estonia's annual intelligence report describes Russian and Chinese ambitions in cyberspace. Threat actors are hard at work against Apple's new processors. Kevin McGee on the Canadian National Cyber Threat Assessment for 2020. Our guest is Mark Testoni from SAP National Security Services on the Biden administration's first 100 days. Plus, lessons from the ice and how hackers became cyber criminals. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Friday, February 19th, 2021. Microsoft published what it calls its final update on Redmond's internal investigation of Solaragate yesterday. They found no evidence that threat actors gained access to either production servers or customer data and concluded that Microsoft systems were not used to attack third parties. They did find signs that the intruders were able to inspect a few code repositories for Azure cloud identity and security programs, for Exchange, and for Intune mobile management. Microsoft takes away from Solaragate a renewed commitment to zero trust. For its part, the U.S. government continues to mop up what's been by all accounts an effective and quite damaging cyber espionage campaign. Ann Neuberger, U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor for Cybersecurity and Emerging Technology, has been careful to set expectations. The U.S. government is still in the relatively early stages of coming to grips with the incident. The federal news network quotes her as saying, quote, If you can't see a network, you can't defend a network. And federal network cybersecurity need investment and more of an integrated approach to detect and block such threats. End quote. So there's a slog ahead, but Newberger thinks the end result will be better security. Agencies will build back better with more modern, more resistant systems. Compromised versions of the SolarWinds Orion have also affected other organizations outside the U.S. Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund has disclosed that it downloaded and installed a compromised version of Orion last July. They realized what they'd gotten into this past December 13th and since then have taken steps to fix the problem, the media outlet DN reports. The Netherland Times reports that an investigation by Bitdefender in cooperation with the radio news outlet Argos has uncovered a large cyber espionage operation, apparently Iranian in origin, that's managed to establish its infrastructure in two Amsterdam data centers. The basic malware, Foudre, that's lightning in French, was identified in 2016 and has been active for about a decade. It's added new command and control capabilities as well as a new component, Tonair, Thunder, a second-stage payload used for persistence, surveillance, and data exfiltration. Bitdefender writes that Tonair could allow attackers to take screenshots, collect recent files and documents with specific extensions, and even record audio using the system's microphone before uploading that data to the attacker-controlled CNC. The operation appears to target devices in the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and India. 
Estonia, which lives in a relatively rough neighborhood next door to Russia, which has received more than its share of Russian attention in cyberspace, and which for some years has punched far above its weight in the fifth domain, this week published its annual intelligence report, International Security and Estonia. The report concentrates on Russian activities and the interests and pressures likely to shape Moscow's operations. It also includes a coda on the other big cyber power a bit farther to the east, China. Different readers are struck by different aspects of the report. The Times of Israel fastens on the prospect of Russian information operators using the stress of the COVID-19 pandemic to divide Western allies. Your active, for its part, is struck by what the report has to say about Russian capabilities to deploy deepfakes in the service of influence operations and disinformation. Security firm ESET reports that threat actors have begun to work on Apple's new M1 Max, the ones equipped with Apple's in-house chips. The M1 processors run on ARM architecture, a departure from Cupertino's former preference for Intel x86 chips. In the Objective-C blog, researcher Patrick Wardle summarizes his own analysis as follows, quote, so we've succeeded in finding a macOS program containing native M1 ARM64 code that is detected as malicious. This confirms malware adware authors are indeed working to ensure their malicious creations are natively compatible with Apple's latest hardware. End quote. Researchers at Red Canary earlier this month noticed some macOS malware that established persistence through Launch Agent. They write, quote, our investigation almost immediately revealed that this malware, whatever it was, did not exhibit the behaviors that we've come to expect from the usual adware that so often targets Mac OS systems. The novelty of this downloader arises primarily from the way it uses JavaScript for execution, something we hadn't previously encountered in other Mac OS malware, and the emergence of a related binary compiled for Apple's new M1 ARM64 architecture. Red Canary calls the activity cluster Silver Sparrow and says that, for now at least, it lacks a payload. They acknowledge work done on the malware by VMware Carbon Black and Malwarebytes. The Texas winter storms aren't, of course, a cyber incident, but they may hold lessons for business continuity and recovery planning against the possibility of cyber attacks on power grids. In this case, according to the Wall Street Journal, A number of data centers have done fine, but the storm's been harder on humans than machines. And finally, Avast takes a look at the history of hacking and sees a progression, or more properly a regression, from fun to felony, from lulls to looting. The history they see suggests that people once broke into systems as a chest-thumping way of showing off their skills, a bunch of bravos out counting coup and not interested in much more than the glory, and, of course, in outshining the other bravos, not to mention the jocks who used to steal their lunch and stuff them into lockers. Then the hackers discovered that there was money to be made and were on the slippery slope into the criminal underworld. Hackers became cybercriminals. So, Avast's bloggers have a point, although one can't help recalling that infamous hacker, Captain Crunch, the OG phone freak, he was also interested in making free long-distance calls on Ma Bell's dime. As they would have said in San Fernando Valley, dude. So we doubt that hacking ever had a prelapsarian past. The serpent was whispering possibilities in Cyber Eden before most of us knew it was even a thing. And now, a word from our sponsor, ExtraHop, securing modern business with cloud-native network detection and response. The massive shift to remote work has turned the reality of work on its head. With cloud and multi-cloud adoption, comprehensive visibility is more important than ever. But in order to protect your business, you need more than unified visibility. You need intelligence response workflows so teams can collaborate easily and act quickly. ExtraHop helps organizations like Wizards of the Coast detect threats up to 95% faster. 
As John Kreese, senior IT engineer, puts it, quote, ExtraHop is helping us accelerate cloud adoption by ensuring our workloads are secure. See how it works in the full product demo, free and no forms required, at extrahop.com slash cyber. That's extrahop.com slash cyber. And we thank ExtraHop for sponsoring our show. When a new president takes office, it's become standard practice to announce a list of policy goals and aspirations for the first 100 days of their administration. And President Biden is no exception. There's symbolism there, signaling priorities. Mark Testoni is CEO of SAP National Security Services, and he joins me to discuss what cybersecurity issues should make the cut for being on that first 100 days list. In a lot of ways, we're... What we've seen in the last few years is there's been kind of an increased awareness of threats in this area, at least at a, an aggregate sale from on the threat of China and supply chain to some degree because of what happened in a 2016 election. There is greater awareness of cyber in general. So that's all goodness. I think we often, and the expansion and growth of the CISA, and the work that was done under uh, the director, Christopher Krebs, I think was was noteworthy in the last few years. But the reality is, is we're coming off of a breach of a new calculus and consequence with solar winds. And, and we've also, we're looking at cyber, I think the vectors of cyber are beyond the concept of breaches, which we've all been hearing and dealing with. But the nuance around it as well is kind of the information that we hear and process and how that's implicated by cyber you know, and, and the authenticity of things. So it's the debates around that and how do we clean it up? So beyond just being this, if somebody's going to get in and steal my information kind of aspect or get into my systems aspect of cyber, we've also really amplified this whole disinformation part of it and that vector. So it's a much more complicated problem on the one hand. And I think, unfortunately, we are still in a place where we kind of look at cyber as the government has a set of programs and the private sector is trying to do certain things. And although there's been some collaboration, I think we've got an opportunity for collaboration that needs to be exploited there. This is not a problem that's going to be solved by one or two sets of parties, it is, it's kind of a, there needs to be a national focus and attention on this. Well, it seems to me like this is one of a, a handful of things where there really is true, sincere, good faith, bipartisan support. That there's recognition that this is a problem that, that everyone needs to address together. Um, do you agree with that assessment? I agree. I mean, there was a, uh, we've had several, Congress has looked at this, it's passed legislation, it's had bipartisan support going back a number of years. We've seen over multiple administrations, the expansion of the Homeland Security's role. Uh, there was a, a bipartisan Cyberspace Solarium Commission that laid out a, a plan that talked about establishing a national cyber director and developing a national cyber strategy. So all these things speak to exactly what you said. We got to get on with executing against it, which is probably a combination of things. And we really do need to develop a strategy. So I think our heart's in the right place. I would agree with you. I think most people agree with us. And we also need to understand it's not a static problem. This is going to be something that's with us forever at a level. It's always going to be a threat, much like security has been since the beginning of man. We need to recognize it and such, and we need to engineer it more up front rather than behind as we approach the new world. And when I start looking at things like 5G and how that's going to change our lives and world, it's going to be an opportunity for, for this, but it's also going to be critically important if we're going to really leverage 5G. It's funny. I remember, you know, growing up in the 70s and seeing the, the TV commercials saying, you know, don't be a litter bug. Um, and uh, <laughs> you, you, know, you remember we, those. It's fascinating. And I think we all remember the picture of the Native American in the in the canoe. Right, right. Yep. And the, the one by the side of the road with the, the tear rolling down his face at the, yep. the litter. Yep. Yep. That's, it's iconic. This is what we need, Dave, in my mind. That's the kind of impact. Our, if our kids, 
your grandkid or son and my grandchild are doing a yeah. podcast in 40 years and they're, they're remembering things that we were able to do during this time, I think it would be critically important. What do you think about this notion of, of having um, something like the NTSB, you know, where uh, major breaches are automatically uh, evaluated, investigated? You know, I, I think we do need to do that, but we've got to create a, an environment for it that allows for collaboration. You know, the FAA and the air, air main line, plane manufacturers and the airlines have built really a sense, and including on an international level, have built a sense of trust up that they can do this, right? Mm. We haven't built that framework yet. So I think that could be an outcome. But we can't, you know, one of the concerns I have is turning this into something that feels punitive to any of the players. I'm not saying that it ultimately doesn't end up in punishment if there weren't negligence. But right now, what we have a tendency to see and, and being someone that works with the government as well is like if requirements will come down and, you know, basically they'll be directed upon. I'm not saying that that isn't part of the calculus, but we need to create a collaborative environment to solve these problems and we need to learn from them. And we also need to understand the nature of breaches has changed. The solar winds one was an attack on our software supply chain. And the implications of that are much greater than just not that it isn't you know, the disclosure of PII and things that have happened historically. I mean, these breaches is important, but this has ramifications in our infrastructure that are far, far broader and will be much more important in a 5G world where we redistribute the Internet again. So I, a long answer to a short question, but I, I think that we we want to make sure we don't create the law of unintended consequences by creating apparatus without really having a strategy behind it, if that makes sense. That's Mark Testoni from SAP National Security Services. There is a lot more to our interview. Don't forget to go listen to extended versions of this and many other interviews at CyberWire Pro. It's on our website, thecyberwire.com. And now a word from our sponsor, Detectify. New vulnerabilities in web technologies like jQuery, Apache, WordPress, you name it, pop up each day. 1,500-plus CVEs were reported on NIST.gov in October 2020 alone. Sifting through them to find which ones are relevant, then research them, well, nobody got time for that. Detectify collaborates with leading ethical hackers to develop the latest research into security threats from hacker to scanner in as fast as 25 minutes. Using payload-based testing, Detectify automates relevant tests with proven exploits to simulate attacks in a safe way that doesn't take down production. Get hacker knowledge in your hands for security that goes beyond the OWASP Top 10, monitors subdomains for potential takeovers, and uncovers vulnerabilities you thought were fixed. Level up and start detecting critical vulnerabilities in time with Detectify. See for yourself with a two-week trial at Detectify.com slash Cyberwire. And go hack yourself. That's Detectify.com slash Cyberwire. And we thank Detectify for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Kevin McGee. He's the Chief Security and Compliance Officer at Microsoft Canada. Kevin, it's always great to have you back. Um, I want to touch base with you um, on the uh, recently published Canadian National Cyber Threat Assessment uh, for 2020. Uh, there's some interesting uh, things that uh, folks up your way have published. What sort of things caught your eye? So the report is the second uh, that they've published, and it's the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, which is Canada's authority on cybersecurity, part of the communication security establishment we call the CSE, which would be sort of the equivalent or, or cousin of your NSA. And uh, the, head of, um, the head of the organization, Scott Jones, really challenged his organization to make bold predictions and really you know, focus on, on seeing trends uh, farther out. So it was interesting to read in the 2018 report again and see what they got right and what they got wrong and then reread the the 2020 report 
And I like reading reports like this because often in our industry, we read very technical reports with very technical analysis. And uh, this report in particular is very focused on this, the threats to the citizens of Canada and how we look at the attack vectors and how we looked at the challenges from their lens rather than from the technologist lens. And I think that uh, that diversity of opinion and challenging of my premises is really why I enjoy reports like this. And so what were some of the highlights for you? So one of the things that really immediately jumped out at me is I'd kind of written off uh, crypto jacking as a uh, attack vector. And uh, maybe that was because of the uh, the drop in, in Bitcoin. We're not seeing it, it being pre- um, you know, as, as, as often uh, popping up in our day to day. Whereas two, three years ago, I would have really thought that crypto jacking might have taken over the whole ransomware market and we would have been mm. done with ransomware. And we're seeing as the rise in prices are increasing that that's becoming a, a new attack vectors again. So again, pr- uh, challenging my premises, uh, seeing what What's, uh, what's happening from another uh, threat vector makes me as a chief security officer then think, okay, I now have to invest some time in in looking at this and seeing how it's affecting my organization and my customers as well. And how does this compare to things that are that are tracking you know other places around the globe? Are are there some specifically regional things, or or as as things happen in Canada, so so they do you know globally? I think it's it's interesting that um, you know we are really becoming a, a global market for all things, including cybercrime. And cybercrime is really top of the the list. It's the number one threat vector to Canadians as well as in my most organizations. That's what I'm reading around the globe as well. So I think it's different sectors maybe are, are under attack in Canada than other countries, but the uh, the trends are very much the same. And uh, I guess it's because cyber criminals don't really look at geography or zip codes, they look at IP addresses. And that's uh, that's really made a, a level playing field for smaller countries to come under attack. And I think there's a, a message in there, a lesson to be learned is that just because you're, you know, you live in a smaller country that may not, you know, uh, you may not think you're, you're going to be attacked or you're going to uh, be a victim of some of these crimes because you're you're obscure. That's not the case anymore. Um, and we're seeing really the trends that are tracking in Canada very, very similar uh, to those tracking around the world. All right. Well, the report is the Canadian National Cyber Threat Assessment. Kevin McGee, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for CyberWire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. Give your body the comfort it deserves. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker, too. As you're enjoying your weekend, don't forget to take a few minutes and check out Research Saturday, my conversation with Bohan Zajerna. He's a senior information security consultant at Infigo, also a member of the SANS Institute. We're discussing his research on using Chrome extension syncing to exfiltrate data. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. In the turbulent security space that's filled with overhyped solutions and empty promises, Red Canary breaks through with radical transparency and a laser focus on delivering outcomes. They are relentless in their vision to create a world where every organization can achieve its mission without fear of cyber attacks. Great security operations depend on detection and response capabilities that reduce the time attackers can spend in your network. That means having detailed visibility and broad detection in the places where they operate, your endpoints, your network, and your cloud environments. 
Red Canary is passionate about improving outcomes, not just for their customers, but for the entire community. You see that passion in the content they deliver and via their open-source projects like Atomic Red Team. At the end of the day, Red Canary is your security ally. See what it's like to have a partner in the fight. Visit redcanary.com today. And we thank Red Canary for sponsoring our show. 